Habibi, welcome to Dubai. We are here for the next three days at Will Brown's Dubai Boardroom Mastermind, a good friend of mine who asked me to speak to his mastermind members this weekend to share all of my YouTube ads scaling strategies to help them scale their coaching, course, or even agencies to multiple seven and even eight figures and beyond. And without further ado, I'm gonna take you behind the scenes with me to show you the sights, the scenes, and everything that Dubai has to offer so you can experience it yourself. Let's go. What's up, Will? Guys, good oh, to we're see early, you. Welcome. Dude. Welcome. Good to see you, buddy. Dude, good good to, to have you, you here. Such a pleasure to meet you, man. And you, buddy. Good to see you, man. Welcome to Dubai. Yeah, Welcome good back. to see you, man. Good to see you, buddy. Good to meet you. Hi, Hi Ben. Pleasure. Yeah, Ben. You know Brian? Yeah. yeah. How are you? Yeah, Ben. What's up? Nice Brian, nice pleasure, nice to meet you. From, uh, Edsburg, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Pleasure to meet you. Yes. Good to see you. Oh, looking fucking Yeah, stacked, man, looking dude. amazing. I like you, dude. How's your it, was it was good, good man. It was a long day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm here. How about you? Good, man. I arrived on Wednesday. Okay, so you've been here for a couple of days, yeah. Nice. The weather was a bit crazy. Yeah. What's up, gentlemen? Brian Moncada, founder of AdSpend.com. Um, currently in Arizona, but moving back to Miami at the end of the year. Uh, right now we're doing a 250K, 255K as of last month, cash collected. Um, we were previously doing an agency before, full time. Lots of team members, lots of overhead, lots of clients. We've switched to a more streamlined, productized service, done for you, done with you. Our biggest bottleneck right now is still productizing the service, especially from the VSL filming and the actual funnel side for clients, because we're so used to doing done for you and having clients that already have all of it set up, that teaching these other skills now is something that's been uh, a little bit of a bottleneck, obviously. So that's the biggest thing for us right now. Uh, our goal is to get to 500K at the end of the year as well. If you could expand like, in, like because I find myself in that position right now, you know what I mean? I don't like to quit on my ideas, I work really hard um, like every day, but the reality is my market, and we can export this maybe in the next few days, the market in which I operate, there's many um, dependencies that are, outside, that are outside of my control. Now, with that said, I don't, I don't want to put that as like excuses because I hate that kind of, you know, mental model, you know what I mean? But. Um, you know, lately, because of that reason, it's because it, it, I have a goal. If I'm not able to reach that goal, might as well like, do other thing. You know what I mean? Uh, although I'm comfortable and I don't have that problem, but why not explore like a different version? Of someone said like a while ago. And when I had and I had to kind of let go of the ego, let go of everything, to just admit to myself, okay, I have done a good job. I've built a business that I fucking hate to my guts to 30k a month at 19 years old. Hmm, could I be doing better if I actually like the thing just a little bit, right? And so you take the loss short term, but long term you win, and there's kind of no... And the good thing for me now is that now I know that I have the capabilities to let go of things that means a lot to me, to make better decisions, right? The issue is that if you keep pushing with this, the next product or project that you run will inevitably at some time fail, and you will be stuck in a failing business for a very long period again if you don't do this now. So you know the good thing about you if you saw this today, agree with yourself and admit to yourself, leave the business, it's fucked, it's lost. The next time you run into a similar issue, you will have the mindset and the skill to let go of it. And not a lot of people have that. A lot of people are like what you are right now, very stuck and not willing to admit that they're stuck. And it took me one year of breaking down my ego and admitting to myself that I build a bad business that is unsellable, that is horrible to run, that I don't like, my employees are not even that happy to work for the business anymore, I've completely fucked it. And when I admitted that and, and took the laws publicly closing down my company, I was like, fuck, 
right? And then it took me, we started our info product and the second month we did 65K of revenue, double of what I have ever made. And it took us, it took me 30 days to build it and, and after 30 days we were making 65K a month. But that potential doesn't open to you until you make the very hard decision. Okay, so day one of Dubai Mastermind is almost over and already a ton of breakthroughs are happening inside the room. And one of the biggest takeaways so far is just number one, if you haven't yet, for whatever reason, paid to join your first mastermind, just freaking do it, okay? Because I've been to almost 100 masterminds at this point and well invested over you know $400,000 in my own self-education in masterminds, courses, coaching programs. And if there's one thing that's always true no matter what, it's that when you get in the room and you hear yourself telling the stories that you've been telling yourself every single day about why you're not doing the things you should be doing or why you should be doing the things that you know you already need to, and then you hear someone else tell you exactly what you need to do and justify that decision so you can do it, that's when the light bulb moment goes off, that's when you write it down, and that's when you say, okay, I'm clear on exactly what I need to do. And sometimes it helps to pay money to actually have someone tell that to you. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. That's how I've gotten my business to where it's at today because of being in rooms like the one we're in right now. So I'm gonna walk back in, finish out day one, and uh, I'll see you after. Day date, 40 millimeter. Solid gold. Solid gold. It's got a nice weight to it, hasn't it? Yes. yes. I'm picking one up today. Are you? I'm picking my first, uh, my first proper watch up today. Uh oh. What are you getting? I'll show you. Can't wait, dude. I want to see it. Yeah, that was on my phone screen for two years while I was trying to get to a, a million a year. And then, yeah, yeah. When I got to the seven figures mark, I bought it. That's what I'm picking up today. Yeah, show that, Mike. What is it? Let's see. GMT Master 2. Ooh. <laughs> this is going to be even heavier, bro. That's and I like look, it. That's going to look how we And you're getting the uh, the Jubilee dial, too. Yeah. yeah. This is nice. Getting that at dinner tonight. That's going to be sick, bro. Yeah, it is. Because uh, I think the gold matches with uh, my jewelry and shit. Well, plus the black will stand out with your glasses. Yeah, yeah. We'll see you guys down there. Um, that's nice. Dude, that's, that's beautiful. very nice. Have some to it. Yeah, yours is gonna feel real nice <laughs> and snug on your arm. Beautiful. So now we're here at the Dubai Marina, about to head on the yacht to spend sunset watching Mastermind and collaborating and networking with the other members to share our top takeaways from day one at the Dubai Mastermind. I wish you were here, but I'll see you on the yacht. Day one is a wrap. We are now on the yacht in the middle of Dubai, sailing around. Everyone's here collaborating, networking, masterminding, just like how it should be. For now, I'm gonna get some takeaways from some of the members and share them with you so you can hear what they had to say too. I have everything I wanted five years ago now. Yeah, literally. Uh, has much, what, what has the biggest things that have changed in your life besides obviously? Really? I'm living my dream. I literally am. We all are. I wanted to be able to do exactly what we're doing right now. Be able to travel across the world, meet with my like-minded entrepreneurs, and just be able to have fun and talk about business. This is exactly what I wanted to do. Me too. So the business actually allows me to do that. I see you on stage, bro. Stage, stage, man. Like speaking. You've, you've got something about you, man. You've got something. There's just a, you've got this special energy. Yeah. You're, there's just something about you. You're like a, I, I can't describe it. You're like a, one of those guys that people, you know, you lead. You're like a leader. It's just a cool energy. I appreciate it. I want to speak on stage. That's why I want to do events. More masterminds. I love it, dude. I love hosting, bringing people together, making sure everyone's having a good time. Man. Well, maybe that's why I want to do a million a month because I feel like maybe there's a, I haven't made it to where I can confidently sell what I've done so far. Good morning from beautiful Dubai. Welcome back to day two of the Dubai Boardroom Mastermind. And today I'm going to share all of my YouTube ads scaling strategies with all of the members so they can get more leads, more calls, and more high ticket clients to scale their businesses. And without further ado, let's open up the doors and head in for day two. Let's go. Morning for 
fulfillment from the product side. So that's what I mentioned yesterday and I had some good conversations with a few of you guys on the boat. Uh, the biggest issue right now is we're working with clients that aren't as sophisticated as the clients we're used to working with. They don't know how to write a VSL, they don't know how to set up a funnel, they don't know how to do all those things. And that's obviously us having to teach that and go back a couple steps from where we are you know, used to being with the clients we work with and have to teach them you know, like a fifth grader how to do that stuff. From the Instagram feeds, it's, it's very, most people on there are very low, like high dopamine. They just have consumed very little. And when they hear 5, 6K, they're like, yeah. What? What, yeah, what I've also gotten is the leads of mine that did convert on Instagram knew me from YouTube, but YouTube is by far the best for that 4K, 5K offer that you're looking for. So two main things that we did in order to just really understand how to niche down because our revenue was quite funny. We first year was 400k, second year was 1 million, third year was 1.7, fourth year was 6 million and then the year just before we sold was 13 million and then, and then the year we sold was like 17 million. So it just short, right? And the inflection point was basically when we did two things. One was we actually looked where people were already spending big budgets. So we realized that we were trying to convince too many people to do an action that they hadn't done before. However, when we just studied and we said, well, who is already spending on this influencer thing rather than us having to convince them? It became a very easy sell. We were selling uh, campaigns to people like Unilever for half a million after one call because it was like you are already spending 30 million a quarter on influencer stuff. And then the second thing was you focus on the Gen Z market. Um, that was intentional, but that was intentional because uh, when I started the business, I knew that we wanted to sell it at some point. And I basically just like looked at all the potential buyers and I realized that none of them had very niche specific offerings. So the second part of it was, well, when in five, six, seven years we're going to choose to sell the business, we need a really strong story we can actually tell them. And actually to say, hey, all your offerings are quite broad. We're going to, we're going to be the Gen Z partner for you. Absolutely, absolutely cleaned up. So when we actually went through our sale process, we had four people put in uh, bids to buy the company. Um, of all their reasons, the one that just kept coming up was, well, you guys are specialized in the Gen Z audience. And I was like, yeah, I thought about that a few years ago. So those were probably like the two things that we did to shift was like, A, we looked at where people were already spending and then we ignored everyone who needed convincing to spend. So we just like guided their budgets rather than convince them of their budgets. And then the second one was, yeah, we were like uber specific on saying, right, Gen Z, that's a niche, you guys aren't gonna touch it, we're gonna be the people to do that. So those are like two very specific ways in which we're from broad to then being quite niche. Our biggest bottleneck was traffic and we're the agency, right, that runs YouTube ads. Because when you run YouTube ads to target people that are making 250K a month plus in the coaching course mastermind space, you're gonna have to spend a lot of money to get in front of that right person to get a qualified call, right? All of my best clients came from word of mouth referrals, masterminds, partnerships, events, et cetera, which requires you and my time to actually do it, right? And then after going through that and, and trying to scale that with that specific niche and then realizing, okay, if I really wanted to go bigger with the agency, I need to hire more people, offer more services, do adjacent markets like Facebook ads, you know, TikTok ads, et cetera, which is gonna be uh, operationally more complex and less profit. Um, that's when we started transitioning more towards a done with you style offer. But the problem with that, as you're saying, comes with worse clients. And I would say worse, it's just a caliber of client that's not as sophisticated. And so you have to teach them how to do everything like we're experiencing now, right? And it's more scalable, but the sales process is, is a little bit harder because it's not as sexy as done for you. But what we're doing that might be helpful for you, and again, we're still proving out this, and, and it is selling, is we're selling the system by installing it in your business. So we're marketing as, you know, we're gonna install a proven YouTube ads client acquisition system that consistently books at least 25 calls each week on your calendar, you know, guaranteed, right? 
And now, of course, they're buying the qualified calls, but we're giving them the offer. Yeah. We're giving them the sales process. We're giving them eventually, like everyone's saying, I want to give them the setters and the closers to close the deals. You know, not us actually giving them our closers and setters, but people that we've partnered with that already have those people put in their businesses to actually close the appointments that we trust. And then we can actually guarantee those results even more, but it's just about the product, right? So uh, what I'm basically saying is one thing that might be helpful for you is essentially sort of doing what we're trying to do and, and what we are doing, which is a done for you, at least set up initially, which is the easiest part for you. Yeah. And then the coaching on everything else that you and I both know bottlenecks the sale, sales process, offer, mindset around leadership, right? Actually what to expect, because I know cold email, I've hired someone to do it for us. It doesn't take you know, 30 days. It takes more like 90 to 120 to actually truly optimize it. And on the sales calls, what I've realized is, you know, everyone wants done for you, right? Because obviously that's what you're marketing. That's what we're marketing done for you. That's what people want. But a lot of times people don't realize what they actually need. And on the sales call, you have to do the discovery. And then when I transition to the close, I say, well, look, man, we can definitely help you. But based off everything we've talked about, done for you is, is a complete nightmare for you right now. In fact, it's probably going to bankrupt your business. And then I just let that sit. And then I say, and here's why with your, where you're at right now, 20 K a month, right? You're making maybe six K a month and like take home for you personally, you have 15, you know, I don't know how much cash you have in the bank. I'm assuming it's not much because you're paying all these expenses and overhead. You're gonna have to pay a minimum of $5,000 a month for a good agency to run your ads. Right. And that's like a good agency. And then you have to spend at least $5,000 a month to actually, you know, invest in the ads, which is 10 K that's half your margin right there. So I don't think that's a smart idea. I don't know if you don't agree, but what I think is better for you is to actually have us help you set up the system in your business. So that way it's actually getting leads and calls for you first before you pay anybody else to manage it. And then once it's actually working and validated, you can then easily hire someone else to manage it for you. Because that way, instead of investing all this money and paying double just for someone to test it with you, you're able to get the system, get the calls, get the clients that you want, and then comfortably stockpile a budget away for done for you later and upgrade to our back end service, blah, 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 blah. So that's how on the sales process, you can handle that from the marketing side you, and from the vehicle side, that's what we're doing, obviously. The issue for me now is that I'm wearing all the hats. Yeah, yeah. I'm the community yeah. guy, the product guy, the sales guy, and the marketing guy. Your focus goes elsewhere. And when your focus goes elsewhere, you don't have a sales manager or something like that, then the team goes astray. It's, I think it always boils down to teams. Like from everything I've seen, it's always the team. Once you have that superstar solid team, and it takes so long to do that. Man. It exactly. takes so long. And then once you get it though, like you feel confident to make a lot of new, new investments, new decisions, and there's a lot of patience that comes with it as well. It's all in the team, man. All in the team, all in the team. All in the team. Part one of day two has officially wrapped up and I wanna share my top takeaway with you. So Yepe, uh, who is a good friend of mine and uh, you know, you just saw talking about, you know, a lot of the stuff that happens with business, the stress that comes with it. And what he was talking about, managing a bunch of different things, not having time for himself and just putting out fires all day long is probably something that you and I can relate to as business owners, right? We always feel like there's so much to do. And at the end of the day, we're left with nothing to do for ourselves, right? We don't have time for ourselves anymore. And that's a really, really big thing that people, you know, obviously get stressed about. And then when it comes to why he's so stressed, you know, a lot of us sometimes just don't have enough of the cash reserves, reserves in the business that are actually going to allow us to not be stressed all the time. But the problem for me lately, I felt like personally, and this is just me being transparent, is we almost have too much cash in the bank, specifically in the business checking to where, you know, things maybe could be done faster, but there's a little bit of a slower pace, a little bit more of a relaxed pace to actually attacking those things because it's not as urgent. We're not like gonna die if we don't do any work tomorrow, three months, six months, 12 months right now. And it's like, okay, is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? Well, in, you know, you know someone else's case, for example, like, you know, somebody else, it's probably a bad thing because you're always stressed all the time and you're trying to just fix every single problem and you don't have time for yourself. But in other cases, right, like how I felt a little bit lately personally is we have 
a little bit too much. And I know that sounds maybe you know, rude to say or just like, you know, let's just be being honest though. Like sometimes you just, you're just not as, as hungry or, or as urgent on things that you should be, especially with the business because you have too much cash in the business. And so one thing that I took away was, okay, sometimes too much cash in the business is actually too much cash and it could be hurting your performance more than it's helping it, especially with your team and how, move you, how fast you guys move together. And so one thing I'm gonna do is take some chips off the table, <laughs> go put it somewhere that's you know not in the business checking account and be able to get a little bit more fire under me again where okay it's not comfortable for me to see this number anymore therefore i have to put in the work to be able to get that number back to this specific point and then again take the chips off the table and then keep rinsing and repeating so for will what he does is he keeps you know around six to eight months of cash reserves in his business checking account and then he puts that money in real estate once he builds it up anything excess over that then he gets it back down to six months then he invests in real estate again and then he gets it back down to six months and so it's this constant ebb and flow of Getting the cash reserves up in the business when it's too much and you're too comfortable, you take the foot off the gas, you invest in something. And when you invest in something, then now you put it back down to six months. So hope that was helpful. If you've been feeling like you're too stressed out, it's probably because you don't have enough of a big war chest yet, right? Sam Ovens always talks about this. You gotta build a big war chest and you need to actually relieve some of that pressure by stacking cash in your business checking account at least six months to where if you don't work and don't make any money for the next six months, which obviously won't happen to ad men like us, then you can obviously still live comfortably for the next six months. You don't have to worry about it. And you're not stressed all the time waking up and needing to do it. But if you have too much, right, in my case right now, then you actually got to take some chips off the table, put your cash reserves back down to where you can actually manage it, right, to where you're still feeling a little bit like, oh, I don't like that number. I got to work now to really make that number back up. That'll put the fire you need under you. So with all that being said, that's enough for this part. I'm going to go eat, catch up with the guys, and I'll see you back after for part two of day two, where we'll learn about YouTube ads for you. Hi, I'm here with Musa. He is the owner of Faceless Channels on YouTube. What would you say to someone who's just watching this and they're like, man, like they're oh. seeing a bunch of the content and they're, they're, they're like you, bro. Their mind's blown. They don't know where to start, but they're like, dude, I wanna, I wish I was there. Come, you have to come, yeah. yeah. And it's not, not even just the, the masterminds, it's also, Maybe this is the, the top, uh, t top takeaway. What happens between the masterminds? When you, when you have a lunch or when you, yep. you know, these breaks, you talk with people and they tell you little things. That's, that's where these golden nuggets. So if you're on the fence about it, you have to do it. It's so funny. I tell, I tell you all the time watching this video that the reason why you join masterminds isn't really necessarily 100% because of the content and what you're going to learn from the speakers or the presenter. It's because of what you'll learn in the breaks between the actual parts of the mastermind and the conversations you have at dinner at lunch and yeah. the experiences you make with the met with the members like networking those are where those light bulb moments go off because you talk to someone who also has experienced something that you've already been or currently trying to solve in your business and you're like oh man i'm gonna try that 100%. and then that one thing changes everything 100 percent, 100 percent. and there are so many high level people so you can learn from everything everyone i was talking i was talking with a few guys just at at, uh, at lunch and someone was talking about how he optimizes his just his performance, mm. he was fasting, and then he only ate, ate protein, and it's crazy, you know, you're yeah. talking about business all the time, but also these little golden nuggets, mm. they can go a long way. Yeah. Hell yeah, thanks super, appreciate all you, right, man. bro, thank you. Sick. Being a salesman, being a sales manager, and I've learned this the hard way, two completely different jobs, mm. right? So. You would think that the great sales guys are great managers, but sales guys are thinking about one thing only. Hammer, nail, hammer, nail, right? right, right yeah. so, so sales management is much more than that. It's uh, monitoring, it's quality assurance, it's uh, assuring tracking is correct, also analyzing the numbers and the data <coughs> and interpreting what they mean. That's a huge part of it. Every day you're just looking at that and making many judgments about it and decisions that could mean a hire or a fire. Yeah. So, so the first thing is, you look at the guy, is he manage the material? Now, if he's not, and he doesn't understand the job, then he can be a great sales lead. Mm. So a sales lead is different where they're doing what they do, but people are really listening to them, yeah. you know, they're listening to their calls. And also when you're on vacation, he might, or the manager's on vacation, he steps in, mm. and he has a prestige, mm. right? So I have sales leads in all the teams I've worked with. It's very, very important. But truly look, does this guy, has he ever done sales management? If he hasn't, you need someone that understands that gig, comes in, builds the SLP, mm. right? 
shows you how to do it, or maybe you're the sales manager right now, so maybe you build it for him and you mentor him into the role. Okay. Another challenge with this is everybody knows him as a sales guy. That's a problem. So in the team, it's a weird dynamic socially where someone from the outside comes in, they respect him, right? But someone from the inside who they play ball with, you know, they don't believe, hey, this is he ain't gonna find me. Mm. He ain't gonna do fuck that guy. Yep. You know? So so external consultants or fractional consultants or just a hiring manager, again, it's difficult to find one for our space, mm -hmm. is a, a much better approach in my opinion. And then not letting the sales guy feel left out by giving him a lead position so he's the second in command yep. is a much better approach, at least for the interim. Yep. Right? So that, that's my advice on, on that yeah, specific yeah. thing. Well, your pre-call email needs to be very well personalized and structured, and it has to be a micro-commitment that they review. And so the way my sales approach really works is that stuff does most of the selling for me, right? And then the close is really a discussion about financial investment, how we can help them come in, make it easy for them. Uh, so it's a very smooth process. But uh, I would say do that. Uh, <laughs> interviews are really good. Uh, case studies are really good. Interviews where, you, where you're sitting out speaking with the prospect about their journey before, their journey after, what did we have to change together, and it's specific to the niche that they might be into. It's like, easy. It's See, it's always recruiting, man. Like, you know what the funny thing is, is uh, the more I get into this game over the years, 10 years now, 11 years, like, it, it just always comes back to this thing. It's just like uh, Last Dance. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? Just watch that again if you haven't and watch it if you haven't watched it. It's just the importance of the team and seeing your, 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 your company as a team, seeing it as a high performance sports thing, you'll be much more selective, way more selective about the superstar. Cole is the best at this I have ever seen. Cole is an insane recruiter. Like he knows, he knows I want this guy, I want this guy. You know, he knows they're the ones building the business. It's not him. He's the mastermind of getting the people in that position, right? So, so and, you know, uh, uh, Tim was mentioning like it's like departments, right? It's like your department marketing. He wants the best guy in department marketing, the best best guy of department sales. You know, their own CEO is running their whole thing. So that, that's exactly what. It, once you get that, it's just a smooth ride. A piece of work to do would be like get all the case studies you've done of similar clients have it in a really nice deck so that when you are then speaking next to someone, you have a call which is just about the case studies and all you do it for 15, 20 minutes is just like, well, this is you, it worked. This is also you, it also worked. This is also you, it also worked. By that time, it's just like, well, you saw them, they've already saw themselves. So really factor that in into your yeah. sales process. For example, I just literally got a message right then of a client who's meant to be on the phone with a rep and he's saying, I'm on the phone, where is, where is, He's not here on the phone with me. <laughs> that hurts. This happens, happens. this happens a lot, and every time I ask the closer about it, he goes, no, he was on the wrong link, or there's some kind of, my way, it's not his way, he's a fucking liar kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm like, how do I figure out who's actually telling the truth? You're, you're, you're in a sticky situation <clears throat> because this person you respect a lot, mm. number one. Number yes. two, he uh, is making you dough. He's closing. Mm. Okay, so diva salespeople are some of the most dangerous people to have in your organization. So once he hits that, let's say you're 8%, month two, if he hits this on month one, month two, his 8% goes to 10%. If he can maintain that, you're still very profitable at that number. If he can maintain that month three, he goes to 12%. And the way I like to do it is if they don't hit that on month three, they go right back to the bottom. Wow. Then after that, what I'll do is you get an incentive for 25 units. I love 25 units per rep. This is a golden number for me. Obviously, you have to give them the opportunity for that number. So that typically means 80 to 100 unique calls, not total. Get 100, uh, that much, they should get 25 million, they'll get a bonus for that, about $3,000, and then this. And then obviously there's competitions. So let's say, for example, the month is going kind of slow, we're in the final week of the month, we want to drive a push. We'll have, I like to call it the Clutch Master, okay? That's made that up, okay? You can call it whatever you want. But I call the Clutch Master competition. First place gets this, second place gets this, third place gets this, it's typically, First place, to qualify, you must have five units plus at an average price of $6,000. Average price, $6,000. Uh, yeah, so that's typically what we do. And then first place, $3,000, $1,500. Who's seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? Third place gets? Five, five, yeah, five. No, no, it's at a state Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, or is that second place? Second, yeah, second place. 
front place is your fire. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, but, but third, I always give them some cigars because I love cigars. So, <laughs> so, 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 yeah. So, so this is typically how I'll push the month. Okay. Now, now there's a bit of controversy around this uh, because there's intrinsic motivation and extrin extrinsic motivation. So intrinsic is how you really want most of your reps to be, which is they want to be the best. Okay. But again, unfortunately, you're dealing with children sometimes. Okay. So intrinsic motivation isn't always there. And personally, if I knew my reps weren't feeling that way, I would probably look for another rep. I want my reps to want to be the best. The reason I was good ever is because I wanted to be the best. I didn't even care about the commissions first. I cared about the leaderboard first. I wanted to be the best. So that's the most important thing. But there's nothing wrong with my opinion with the drive. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. So you could drive them end of the week, middle of the week, something like this, nice little thing. Make sure that they qualify for a certain thing because this then will make sure you're very profitable to hit the prize that you're paying out. Uh, and then in my opinion, this is the best uh, type of commission structure. This can only work if you have consistent lead flow. So if you have 500 leads per month applications, let's say, this will work. Each rep always gets 100 leads per month, 100 uh, live calls, this will work. If they're not, this won't work. Because it's impossible for them to hit you know, uh, this number. It'll be impossible. You're literally driving them up the road. So what you can do is change it and do it within the month. You could do it within the month. So instead of over three month period, you say, in the same month, if you get to 50K, your commissions get to this. If you get to 100K, your commission within the month, right? So that's if kind of you're a bit of a younger company. But if you're a, an older company that has the opportunity, per month is really, really good. Could uh, you change the revenue number instead of 150K cash collected? It's a, it's a conversion rate? No, I will not do that. No. I don't do that. <coughs> it's just, like I've, I've had this before. It's just like the conversion rate thing is... Uh, it's subjective. Like if they could do 50 calls and get 25%, it's just like you know that that, that doesn't reflect on the uh, PNL of, of the of the of the company. I want the PNL to reflect yeah. of, of the reward. Yeah, because it, it, it's a, it's a profit thing. So I would do it this way. And anything else on this? Any questions on this? So you're saying if they hit projections month one, it's eight percent. If they hit it month two, again back to back, it's ten percent. Yes. If they hit it month three, then it's twelve percent. But if they don't hit month three, they don't get the twelve percent, and then it goes back to the go end. right back to the beginning. Comes the wheel. And then you're saying if it's uh, and you're saying the other way you can do it, we have to have a lead flow for this. Yes. Is eight percent if they're one third of the way projections? Yes. And then ten percent if they're two thirds of the way. Correct. Yes. Within the month. Uh, but again, all of these numbers are subjective. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's always asking yeah, me what's yeah, the best yeah. commission. Also, there's one more thing I'll add to this. You can do this so you don't have to. It does add a layer of complexity. But this is only for new cash. You can cap AR if you want. So AR can be capped at 8% always. So really, you're being rewarded for new cash. And most businesses in our space, they love the cash up front. I'm here with the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Mike Diamonds. Funny story, I was following Mike even before I met him in person, even before he became a client of ours at adspend.com, watching him, teaching me how to lose fat when I was in college at Arizona State University, eating all of the wrong processed foods. Thanks to him, I lost a lot of weight and got in shape. Dude, what's been your biggest takeaway so far of part two, or day two, part two? So today we spoke a lot about sales and it's very easy to think of it as a transactional process, mm -hmm. right? You want to have someone come on the phone, buy your product, you're very excited, yeah. of course, that's your main intention. But what you need to remember is that at the base level, it's a relationship that you're going to be creating with people. You have something to offer them that you genuinely want to help them with. And if they're going to invest, it means it's pretty important to them. Yeah. So if you really always sit on the phone or speak to anybody, think about their best interest. And really that's why I worked with AdSpend before we worked with Brian. He actually said, maybe it's not a good idea we work together right now. We got into the mastermind and then we worked together even more. Yeah. Now we've established that relationship. Yeah. So if you think of everybody you speak to and you think about your company establishing a relationship, even with us at Scott by Science, we think about all our clients as patients and we don't want them ever to go to a hospital. So if you think of it that way, you're just gonna get so many people come through your door, which as a byproduct, yeah. your company grows. So yeah. if you just do that, you'll do amazing. Huge, huge, because most people out there, they do a one call close, or they're so used to trying to collect the money today and now, right? right. And that's, that, that's the wrong mindset, like you're saying, because you as the founder, we as the founders, we have a reputation to protect. Exactly. And when we're managing a sales team or closers, the closers want to make money. Yep. We also have to remind them, like David said in there, build a pipeline yep. and make sure you actually do a relationship-based sale, because they might not buy today, maybe it might not be the right time, yep. but you make sure you follow up with them and give them a good value between. 
I think something also just to add there is also to realize where they are in their journey. Yes. And that's part of like what the discovery is, this discover where they are, right? Yeah. Are they right in the beginning? Do they need to first go through some things that they can get for free first? Yeah. Maybe give them a bit of value and then say, hey, come back to us in a week. Let's see how you implemented that. And then they might be a perfect fit. Huge. Thank you, bro. Cool. Anytime, man. <laughs> perfect. Okay, guys, I'm here with Frankie Lee, and we just got done with day two, part two. Dude, this guy's just been blowing my mind, reminding me about what it's all about. Because what were you just telling me right there? I want, I want I'll, to hear I'll, this. I'll, I'll, I'll say simply this, right? We've, we've talked about everything in this mastermind, everything from sales to marketing to driving more revenue to selling companies and businesses. And, and I was just saying to Brian, like, everything that we talked about today, none of it matters a fuck. None of it. Because at the end of the day, right, when, when, you, when you break it break it down it's all mindset right and if your mind isn't right and like we've been talking about getting over some of the limits in your mindset that might hold you back in yeah. business if you don't get over them you the marketing doesn't matter the sales don't matter selling the exit in the business doesn't happen unless you get over yourself and get over in the mindset so to any of you out there that are looking to grow in any area of your life make sure your mind is right because if your mind's right and you're on form you can implement any tactic at any time yeah and like specifically he was telling me he's like leo dude like this is a conversation you've been having on your mind thinking about for a long time and until you actually have it and step up as the person to do it you're always going to be limiting your scale in your business because you're not that person that's actually doing it that was huge for me so, to hear. so so you can only grow as an entrepreneur to the size of the container that you allow yourself to grow to mm. right so like if you put a, if you put a baby shark in a, in a in a shark tank this big it'll grow to a certain size and then you put it in a bigger one it can grow to you put it in the sea it can grow to a big size right and that's the same with all entrepreneurs like we're, we're all just we're all just capped by the level of our thinking process by our thought process by how we move how we think how open we are and what yeah. we say and, and how we communicate and everything like that so i hope that helps a lot of you out there and uh, i hope it helped you bro bro it did thank you so much bro appreciate it People that start spending a lot of money on ads take their focus away from the organic. The moment they do that, guess what? Their channel stops really growing. So now as a result, they're not being consistent with their organic. Yeah. Yeah. And then their ads are making them all the money. So they're focused on scaling the ads. They're not focused on the organic. Therefore, their channel doesn't grow. Charlie Morgan's a good case study because he didn't, he's kept consistent. He's actually went from three videos a week to one video a week, but he's growing exponentially now. And we've been running ads from his main channel. And we tried a second channel because he heard the same bad advice. He came to us one day and he said, guys, we just got advice that we're going to create a second channel for our ads because it's, it's cannibalizing organic growth. And I knew this already. And I said, we're not going to do that because if we do that it's going to hurt your performance and as your guys' agency and person who cares about you i don't want you to hurt your results so i'm going to push back here and say we're not going to do that and they're like we've already made up our minds we're going to do it second channel it's going to get done and i'm like all right what we're going to do though is we're going to do it over a 30-day window because they wanted to flip it over to tomorrow like upload the ad second channel pause the first channel and then i was like that's going to fuck us and your results which you don't want yeah. Like so we're gonna give it 30 days. The first 15 yeah, days, yeah. we're gonna slowly ramp up the budget to where you're, you're, you're spending less on your main channel, spending more, spending a little bit on your second channel. To compare. Second 15 days, we're gonna we're gonna then completely get it to where it's one third main channel, two thirds second channel, and then at the end of the 30 days, we're gonna see if we can make a switch completely. And they're like, okay, we'll do that, bro. 30 days come by, they're getting a point five x return on ads on their second channel, point six maybe. They're getting a consistent 3x like, on, on their on their main channel. Their second channel just can't perform better. Why? Because their second channel is not optimized for people to buy from that channel. It's optimized on their main channel. And when you run ads from your main channel, they're going to watch your videos organically anyways because they're clicking on your main channel, which then gives you more subscribers. So it's only going to give you more subscribers anyways. If you do a second channel, it's there's no content. You're not uploading on that channel. It doesn't make any sense. Back in the day, you would think with gamers, you would sit behind your friends watching games the whole day. You won't play it, but you'll watch your friend play God of War the whole time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then, guys started uploading that onto YouTube, yeah. and then they're like, shit, a million views. It's because people like that, yeah. right? So, it's the same concept. And even myself, I'm guilty of it. I don't know why he did that. You. And even, let's say this happens for you, you'll have a video that will hit. 
the dopamine is gonna want to make you satisfy that again and go after it. Yeah. yeah, but you shouldn't. It should be like be 50 50 where you're like, okay, this is what I want to say today. Yeah. But you know what? Today I'll make a video for growth, but have zero expectation. And you'll get into like this state of flow with your videos. That now people are like, damn, what a brand. Just wrapped up dinner with the boys, and uh, we're gonna call it an early night. We're gonna be heading back to the hotel now to get some sleep, relax, recover, wake up early tomorrow, hit the beach, and by beach I mean pool because the beach is too far, get some sun, you know, refresh ourselves, maybe hit a little bit of a body weight workout, you know, get some blood flowing, get the arms pumping, some energy, right? And then we'll get ready to speak because today was a really sick day. And I'm not even mad I didn't get to speak because there's always tomorrow. But ultimately, I learned so much as you just saw. Man, <laughs> this is why I love investing in myself, my business, and my future. And joining Masterminds because like you heard, you know, <laughs> like you heard Frankie said earlier, right? It's about the conversations, the things that are all in here. And sometimes you just need to get around people playing at a higher level just like you, around the level you are so you can help each other grow. I couldn't be more energized right now. I love doing this. I could do this for the rest of my life. Going to masterminds, traveling, getting to meet people. And this is exactly what I will do with the rest of my life. That's why I create these videos for you. To take you behind the scenes with me. To show you everything that I'm learning. To share it with you so it can help you. And uh, you can experience it too. So with all that being said, this is end of day two. We'll cut it here. And for now, enjoy the view. Good morning, good morning. Day three, Dubai Boardroom Mastermind. Mike and I were just talking. By the way, I didn't say this at the very beginning of the video, but the person behind the camera today is someone very special because this is the person that's been editing my content for the last three years. For the first time ever, him and I have met up in person together here in Dubai. His name is Mike Badico, he's from the Philippines. He's been with me and adspend.com for the last three years. The person who's been editing all the videos, the ones you, night, you and I both know and love from this channel is by him, the one behind the camera right now. So not only is this vlog very special for two reasons, the first being obviously this is not only my second time in Dubai, but my first time at the Dubai Boardroom Mastermind, being able to fly out here, uh, be flown out here, get to speak, and be able to mastermind with these amazing people. But number two, because I'm able to bring my team member, Mike, who's been with me for three years with me to celebrate this together, his first time in Dubai, all the way from the Philippines, to meet up together with me for the first time ever in person. And uh, that's something to smile about, be grateful about. And it's funny, him and I were just talking about before the camera started rolling just now about how we both couldn't sleep last night. And you know, one thing I've promised myself and to you is to always document everything on the journey to where I wanna take myself and, and my business. The highs, the lows, and you know, Mike and I were just talking about how we both couldn't sleep. You know, he had a little bit of a headache. Maybe it was the jet lag and he asked me like, you know, what do you think? Is it, you travel a lot. And I said, well, it's probably the jet lag combined with the lack of movement, combined with the lack of sun, combined with all of the thoughts racing through our heads after all day yesterday of learning from the mastermind and those hard conversations that you have to have with yourself and admit to others, you know, what you're struggling with. And for me, I couldn't sleep last night either. I told him, I was like, man, yeah, I didn't get any sleep, maybe, maybe three, four hours. So I woke up this morning around six o'clock. The sun was already out. I immediately opened my balcony, got some sun in my eyes and try to reset my circadian rhythm because you know, I could sit here, moan, complain, bitch and whine about not sleeping last night, but I just got to take it to the face and move on to another day. And so that's what I'm doing here. And, you know, yesterday was, was pretty tough, to be honest. Um, there's some conversations that I know I need to have with myself and that I've been avoiding. Um, and, you know, one thing that I haven't really uh, admitted to you guys on the channel is, you know, what I've been struggling with internally, health-wise, um, due to the stress sometimes that comes with you know, all of the stuff that happens, the pressure, the, the, uh, the overhead, the, the responsibility. And, and you know, it's, a, it's an interesting um, dilemma because this is what I signed up for. Five years ago, I dreamt for these problems, you know. And uh, I'm getting emotional right now because, you know, sometimes I feel like as a man, you, you kind of you, you got to bottle it up. And uh, there's no one really you can talk to about this stuff. And that's why I, I told myself that when I do this channel and I document this for you, it's also for me too, to be able to share 
the real, the raw, the truth. Because, man, I've been struggling with and, uh, this fucking health shit, man. Like my skin, bro. It's been uh, it's been coming out through my skin, and uh, the last year has been tough on me mentally, physically, emotionally. Uh, I, I dealt with a lot of annoying stuff. Apartment in Miami had mold in it. You know, my wife and I had to move out. We moved back to Arizona. Um, internally, didn't really feel confident with that decision. Was second guessing it the entire time. And um, I've realized uh, <laughs> I started sacrificing the life that I wanted. The reason why I started building this business in the first place to have that lifestyle. For, for, the better, for the better of the business. I've sacrificed my lifestyle for the business. I've built my lifestyle around the business. When the whole reason I started this business was for the lifestyle I wanted. I started this so I don't have to have a nine to five, but I've created a nine to five for myself. And I know that sounds selfish and poor me and how could he be complaining? Look at the life he's in, look where he's at. And, and that's the worst part. <laughs> that's the worst part. The reason why I probably haven't talked about it as much because I don't want to be the guy that shows up on camera and cries. I don't want to be the guy that shows up on camera and admits that he's struggling because I'm supposed to be the one that is leading. I'm supposed to be the one that has it all together. I'm supposed to be the one that people look up to, that I look up to. And, and here I am in Dubai, my team member who's filming this and uh, talking to you about what I've been growing through. And I'm not trying to be selfish. I'm trying to help you because there are too many of us out there, probably you watching this right now, that you're struggling with something mentally, physically, and it's stressing you the fuck out. Maybe it's your business, maybe it's your relationships, maybe it's your team, maybe it's your family. I don't know what it is, but there's so much that we as men have to have to be responsible for. And at times we sacrifice our mental health for the greater good of others and and it fucking sucks. The reason why I'm even at the pool right now trying to get some sun and swim is to wash this shit off my body. It was, I couldn't sleep last night. I couldn't sleep at all. I woke up, my skin looks worse than ever, stressing me more out, trying to keep calm, keep cool, wondering what the fuck is going on. I know I got staph, it's, it's spreading a little bit. I'm trying to kill it. it, it won't seem to go away, but the stress is making it worse. And I, I don't wanna stress out anymore. Why am I stressed? I hate to even say it, I, I am not stressed, but I feel stressed at times. And, it, and, it, and it's annoying. And one thing I've realized, like I talked to Jamie yesterday and he said it to me too and he said it to you. If you don't fix this, it doesn't matter all the tactics and strategies, it doesn't matter. Like this, if this is broken, it's never gonna work. And right now I feel like for me, this has been broken the last few months. I've doubted myself, I've worried too much, I've, I've, I've inflicted too much pain and, and I've put too much things deep down. I put other people first instead of myself and I don't wanna live like that anymore. I, I, I have to be selfish for myself right now. Not because I don't want to take care of other people, but because I want to take care of myself first. If I can't take care of me, how can I expect to take care of other people? And uh, I, again, I'm not criticizing, I'm not condemning, I'm not complaining. I'm just here being real, raw, and vulnerable with you. I've been struggling. And if you've been struggling too, then I'm here for you. This is what I do this for. Because I am not perfect. I don't want to be perfect. I'm constantly trying to get better in my life every single day. I want to get to as perfect as possibly I can be. Whatever that looks like. But uh, the only way I can do that is if I share with you what's really going on. And so this is supposed to be a dope vlog. It's supposed to be an amazing time traveling together, especially with Mike here. But uh, something on my heart this morning called me to talk to you today about this right now and to share with you what's been working and not working in my life and in my business. And sometimes the stress can get to you and it's gotten to me. And uh, I've sacrificed my lifestyle for the greater good of the business. And I realize that I gotta do what's best for me. And what's best for me is to, to realize that I'm turning 30 at the end of this year in August. I want to start a family very soon. I want to be able to take care of my family, provide for them. But I need to first fix this in here and have these hard conversations with myself, with some people, and uh, be able to, to communicate that and how I feel because true freedom is being able to say what you mean and mean what you say without fear of what other people think. And that's why I'm here in front of you today to say exactly that. 
I'm here for you. I, I want to be here for you because at times, just like I feel now, I don't feel like anybody's there for me and I have to be there for myself and that's why I want to be there for you because there's no one really there to talk to. You and I both know that. It's, sometimes it's just you versus you in your own head and you got to bottle it up and just try to make do what you can. Be strong for others. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I hate that I'm so emotional, but I know that these emotions are, are, are what allow me to have breakthroughs like this and to be able to share with you and be vulnerable too. So I hope that you're having an amazing day. I'm going to make it an amazing day. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching this. And uh, let's go make day three even better than the last two days together. I'll see you there. Charlie Morgan just hooked it up with the DuPont lighter. He told me I can't be wearing these expensive madman suits without a true madman lighter, an admin lighter. And uh, personally, I always wanted a classy lighter like this. And uh, shout out to Charlie, man. We love working with him. And yeah, this is why. He treats, he treats us just like we treat him. Very, very, very well. Sweet. Thank you, Will. Appreciate you, brother. Yeah, it's real quick, guys. Give a round of applause for Will. I mean, this mastermind is pretty sick. Yeah, I've been to a lot of masterminds, and uh, Will has it really, really set up here for you guys because there's 15 people, no more, no less, and it's very intimate. You know, most, ma I was talking to somebody about this, maybe it was David yesterday, about masterminds nowadays seem like they're more events than actual masterminds. And the thing that makes this mastermind actually different is it's, it's more collaborative, actually more intimate and truly a, a mastermind. So that's what I liked about it. And dude, shout out to you, bro. So now question for you guys. Okay. Before I ask this, how many of you are already running YouTube ads? Okay. One, two, three. Two four weeks, so. beautiful how many of you have thought about running youtube ads for your business okay cool all right so which would you guys rather have okay red pill great creative and an average media buyer or the blue pill average creative and a great media buyer and why don't be shy creative, the creative always wins right that's what grabs your attention creative always wins i think creative i think creative i'm just red pill so <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Anybody think the media buyer? Yeah, I, th I think the media buyer can change the game to you, yeah. Okay. More than the creative. Well, based on this being a red pill, the answer is most likely uh, red pill, but I'm confused because they both, I don't know, but red pill is most likely the right answer. <laughs> Here's what I've learned. And this is a picture of me actually when I was working with Dean Graziosi, right? This meme is very real. Who's seen this meme? Yeah, everyone's seen this meme. If you haven't seen this meme, what this is, is this is the virgin complicated media buyer. Okay, this is the guy who is trying anything and everything from a tactical media buying strategy side to make the campaigns profitable, right? He's, you know, using a consistent naming convention scheme to keep everything organized. He's, you know, doing different audiences, one to 2%. He's trying to target better than Google. He's trying to target better than Google, right? He needs to use a bunch of stuff to make the prop to make the campaigns profitable and what i've learned is that when i was working full-time for dean graziosi i thought i was a god now what i mean by that was everything i touched turned to gold whenever whenever i would launch a new campaign it would work and quickly my ego went through the roof because i realized that like oh i'm, I'm pretty sick like i'm making him a lot of money the company's growing and i'm starting to make more money myself I had, I had this belief that I'm, I'm the best media buyer on YouTube ads in the world, right? And then I got humbled very quickly when I started to get clients reaching out to me that were learning what I was doing for Dean and wanting to work with me on the side and I was getting some clients and starting to build this list, list of clients and roster of agency. And, and when I would do the same things I was doing for Dean, it wouldn't work. The same strategies, the same audiences, the same tactics, the same targeting would flop. Maybe even the same offers sometimes it just wouldn't work and i'm like what the fuck is going on and it was because i realized a lot of the people don't have the experience that dean does the wisdom the knowledge the business the insights the marketing and it doesn't matter how good of a media buyer i was if the offer was shit the creative was even more worse and the sales process was garbage they couldn't close 
And so that's why I made this funny meme, the Chad man <laughs> agency owner, because this guy was exactly what I was. This is actually who I was. I was just launching new campaigns and I was doing all that stuff too. But the reason why it would work was because of the creative and how consistently we were testing new ads in the ads account to actually spend the millions of dollars that we did. Everything I touched turned to gold because the creative was so good. And with YouTube ads, as you're going to learn today, let me go far. The creative is the most important piece. And I wanted to share this with you. So when I was working for Dean, uh, one of the most profitable campaigns that I'm sure some of you have seen at, at one point in the last few years was his Millionaire Success Habits book offer. Who, who, who's read that book, Millionaire Success Habits? No one read it? Okay. Has anyone seen the ads for that? I've seen the ads, seen the ads for that? I was the one running the ads for that. And we've tested over 125 different YouTube ads for just that one offer. 125 different YouTube ads just for that one offer. Free plus shipping book offer, 795, okay? You creative, yeah, different ads, creatives. So who here has tested over 100 ads for their offer right now for their high ticket? You? Okay, beautiful. The reason I asked that and I wanna make this point is because when I work with clients, when I go in their ad account and I look at their stuff, they're always saying, I, I can't get this profitable. And the first thing I do is look at their creatives and they've tested one, two, maybe three ads. And I'm like, okay, well, this guy who's been in the game for 20 plus years selling on TV is testing 125 different ads and we're consistently creating new angles and new hooks and new edits. And he's able to profitably spend on his offer. Why? Because of the new angles and the new hooks. He's constantly refreshing his ads. And so in this game now more than ever with YouTube, the media buying is all algorithmic, right? It's, it's basically automated for you. The media buying is 20% of the battle. 80% is the creative. Now here's why most people fail with YouTube ads. I already alluded to it, but it's very simple. 80% of your results depends on these two things, offer packaging and positioning and creative. So the biggest thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to run ads if you don't have your messaging and your offer solidified. The I help statement that Will shared yesterday is, is exactly what you need to be crystal clear on first before you can even think about running ads. Because if you come to someone like me as an advertiser and you say, I want to run ads and I ask you, you know, who are you targeting? What's your offer? And you can't clearly articulate that, right? Like very, very quick. It's going to be hard for you to, or me to help you because there's no way I'm going to be able to target that type of person when you don't even know who they are and what their pain points are and what's motivating them to want to buy. Does that make sense? Any questions on this so far? And the other thing is the unit economics, like Will was talking about, have to make sense. Right now, high ticket call funnels, VSLs are the best way to sell high ticket because it's very simple. It's ad, you have a sales team, it's, it's the simplest way to do it. Low ticket can work, but low ticket will break if you don't have a high ticket back end. And I'll show you why in a second. The second reason why most people fail is the creative. Most people blame it on the targeting of the agency, unfortunately, right? But typically it's never the case. You only want to run ads when you want to scale. Okay, not when you're trying to start a business, when you want to scale your already existing business that's working and approval, improving, does that make sense? And so here's an overview, right? So I'm going to show you three things. YouTube ads are great for mass market offers, B2C type offers, health and fitness, dating relationships, make money online and biz op. Okay, YouTube ads can also work for B2B if the total addressable market is big enough, agency owners, coaches, course creators, and plenty of other niches too. But YouTube ads will not work well if you're trying to target you know, for example, car dealership owners in Germany specifically, maybe there's only 22,000 of those, right? Okay, so here's the difference between low ticket and high ticket, right? So low ticket, again, I've ran low ticket offers as low as $7.95 for a Flippa shipping book offer, all the way up to $27 for a health and fitness offer for body weight workouts, right? And I've also sold $67 courses for dating, right? How to get more women, land more dates. Um, and, you know, all of those were good courses that helped a very specific person. But the key to a low ticket, obviously, is having a high AOV of $50 or more. So with the free plus shipping book offer that I was telling you guys about, the $7.95, the only reason why that worked is because the AOV was about $35 to $40, like sometimes. But we are acquiring customers for about $20, $25 at scale, spending thousands of dollars a day. What was, so it was the book first? Yep. Then what? So book first, then it was an upsell OTO to a membership, his inner circle. And that was a discounted fee of typically it's a $37 a month, mm -hmm. but it was a discounted fee on the page mm -hmm. if they get in today. Mm -hmm. And then it, I think it was like a, maybe a, a $1 trial. And then it hits the recurring month and month and month after that. 
And then after that OTO was OTO number two, and that was his, um, his actual, like, uh, it was another sort of mindset accelerator course, yeah. like a 497. Yeah. And then after they say yes or no to that, they get sold that same course, but it's a discounted, like, okay, maybe not that price, but here, how about this price? Yeah. And then if they say no to that, then they, or if they say yes to that, whatever, whichever one, they go to the thank you page. Yes. Thank you page has opt into webinar. So now he's going to a real estate profits from home webinar to actually teach them how to make money because now they're getting the mindset from the book and the inner circle, the coaching, and now he's going to teach them how to make money. Yeah. So that's not including any of that, you know? Yeah. So now he's getting them to register for an evergreen webinar that teaches them a real estate opportunity, which was costing about nine ninety seven for the course. Yeah. So good, man. So good. What, what were you spending per day like at, at the height of that? Man, I would, there, was a, there, was a, there was a point for that offer where I was waking up and I would check the Google Ads account on my phone and I'd spent 30, 40 grand yesterday. Wow. Uh, that was also when I had a lot of anxiety too, to be honest, because I wasn't new, I was, I was new to that kind of spend. That was like stretching my limit at that point. Yeah. And then high ticket, obviously, this is the, this is the formula, right? Like opt-in, VSL, application, calendar, thank you page, sales call. Will knows this like the back of his hand. That's how he scaled his company, how he helps you guys scale your companies, how we help our clients scale their offers as well. And, and if you need to talk to anybody about this, Will's the guy as well. So very simple here. YouTube's like college, right? I, I say now YouTube's basically the, t the new TV and YouTube ads are the new TV commercials. But the way you want to approach YouTube is just like how you approach YouTube videos, right? People go to college to do what, right? To learn and to be entertained. So you have to create YouTube ads that are also educational and entertaining. And here's the perfect YouTube ad script. So now I'm going to give you guys the creative process. Okay. This is going to be very important. This is going to be what you want to do when you want to film your first ads. The very most important piece is the hook. Like I said earlier, right with Dean, I wouldn't give him a script. I would give him the hook. And so what I would do is I would say, look, this, this keyword in here, this, this keyword called law of attraction, that's getting you the most sales for your book is, is resonating. The people are buying this, right? So I would use that keyword and I would say, I want you to say the law of attraction doesn't really work, right? Because it, it's working as a keyword inside the audiences. So if he now creates an ad with that data that's already proven, it's going to work even better. And sure enough, it drops the cost per acquisition, you know, pretty much instantly when you launch it to that same audience. Now, of course, you don't need to have data to do that, but here's how you do it, right? In the first 10 to 15 seconds, you want to make a crazy hook, make a big promise or claim, ask a question. Call out your ideal client or customer. Act out the problem or mistake that your clients or customers make. Or you can combine either and all of the above. And so one way to do this, for example, and I'll show you some case studies and actual examples in a second, I think that'd be helpful, is for us, specifically with our YouTube ads for our company, which we run for our you know, YouTube ads offer, I realized that my first set of ads, I wasn't following this principle. <laughs> and the reason why our cost per booked call, qualified call was so high, about a thousand bucks, was because I wasn't being specific to coaches and course creators. I was just saying, you know, YouTube ads is very general. But when I added the call out of coaches and course creators, immediately half cost per marketing qualified call, immediately. And some of you have to think about that when you're talking to your ideal audience. If you're doing a B2C, it's obviously a little bit different, right? That's more indirect. But if you're B2B, like you gotta talk to your very specific ideal avatar. Does this make sense? Any questions on this? Something on, on this line, I, I'm, I've always thought with my YouTube videos and my uh, shorts, those the videos that I see organically perform well, do you think it would be smart to take the hooks and titles of those videos and just throw them in there? Yeah. Because I've spoken to Anna about like, well, I did this in my videos and the video did really well. Do you think I should just do that if I wanted to run ads and just say, hey, organically did well, let me just put that into an ad? 100%. 100%. That's why when, you work with, when we work with clients like Mike or anybody else, like, uh, one of the things I always tell them is don't reinvent the wheel. So you're 100% true, man. Like your, your video is working organically. People are already intently searching for that topic, that title, and it's converting. It's getting you calls. Now you just take that title and you say it as your hook in the ad, right? And you basically create another ad that's a mini version of that YouTube video. If you want to learn more, click the button. I'll show you exactly how this works. I put together a free five-minute training, you know, and then you put them to your VSL. Have you ever tried running, so let's say you did a YouTube video mm -hmm. and it organically got loads of views and calls. Have you ever tried just literally running that video as an ad, as a skippable in-stream? Yeah, but it's, it's not as 
profitable as the direct ads. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, like for example, we have we do that as a remarketing strategy. So with Charlie Morgan right now, who's going to be speaking later, he's a client of ours, and, and and one of the things we do is we take his organic videos that are really growing right now, growing his channel, and we run those as remarketing ads to everybody who's already either opted in or hasn't opted in to give him more value and send him back to his his channel to either book a call through his description and then hit him again with a direct ad. Uh, and then lastly, so this is the second piece, right? So we have the hook as the first zero to 15 seconds, then you have the story and the close, right? So this is the framework I learned from Dean Graziosi. This is the number one takeaway I had out of all my years of working with him, spending as much as I did working with him, okay? The framework of a great YouTube ads, hook, story, close, okay? What's the hook? What's the story you share or tell them? And then what's the close? What are you telling them to do next? Okay, so the story is very simple. Social proof and credibility, right? So my name is Brian Moncava. I'm the founder of adspend.com. I spent over 60, $100 million on YouTube ads in the past five and a half years working with brands like Dean Graziosi, Tony Robbins, mastermind.com, uh, Jeremy Miner, Charlie Morgan, Bedros Koulian, Patrick Bet David. And the reason why I'm showing you this ad is because I know that you're probably a coach or course creator who's looking to scale with YouTube ads. These are the three mistakes you don't wanna do. You see how that was a quick social proof credibility, right? And then I get right into the teaching now. I'm teaching them something. What's problem number one? The biggest mistake is most people fail to actually have an offer that's scalable on YouTube. The, re the way you create that is you have a specific problem for a specific person solved the specific way. It has to be specific, that's a scalable offer. If you don't have a specific person that you're solving a problem for, a specific way, you have no business trying to run ads because you don't even know who you're targeting, who you're talking to, what their problems are, and what your way you can help them is. So if I'm someone watching that ad, would you guys agree that that's probably helpful for someone who's thinking about maybe running ads and they're like, well, yeah, I don't really know who I'm targeting. So I'm helping them on the ad. Does that make sense? And then the next thing is problem number two. The second biggest reason why most people fail with YouTube ads, and maybe you would too if you didn't see this ad, is your creative sucks. And think of your creative as how the, you know, uh, the hook and the story that you're telling them is actually resonating with the marketplace. They don't follow a very specific script template. They just kind of wing it. Or they do one, two, maybe three ads and they say YouTube ads don't work. Well, after spending as much as I have on YouTube, I can tell you the biggest players in the space, they test more than one, two, or three ads. In fact, they test hundreds before they actually say YouTube ads don't work. And I'll show you a few examples of that, and then I'll go to the next point. Problem number three is they start with the wrong type of targeting. On YouTube, there's two types of targeting. There's intent-based, there's interest-based. Most people start with the interest-based, these broad audiences that might be interested in what they're offering. Whereas what we do is we start with the intent-based. People already searching for keywords, comments, questions, concerns about your specific offer, their specific pain points, raising their hands saying, I have a problem and I'm looking for a solution. We go with that type of targeting first to get your ads in front of the right person at the right time for the right price. So already I'm helping you in the ad, building trust, credibility, and then I go to the call to action. By the way, if you want more help with this and you want me to show you the process, walk you through it step by step, click the link. I'm gonna take you to a free case study video, five minutes long, it's gonna show you exactly how our process works, everybody we've worked with, and how we can possibly help you too. It's free, <laughs> the training truly is free, you guys know this, you're marketers, right? There is an opt-in, I wanna collect your name, I wanna collect your phone number so I can send you more emails that are valuable just like this ad and make more offers to you. You don't have to buy them. It's just me being transparent. And then if you don't do this, what's gonna happen? You're gonna continue relying on word of mouth, referrals, maybe Facebook ads, riding the Facebook ads roller coaster, maybe getting the email of death from Facebook. You wake up one night and then all of a sudden your Facebook ad account's banned. Where's your money coming from now? You gotta be diversified, add a second channel. That's one of the best ads that we've done, by the way. Well, this was the longest one. That's probably the easiest case study I can share. And it could probably last as long as this one. So this one's two years, five months, and 27 days. This is a body weight workout course. And this is the one of the hook of teaching them what they're doing wrong by showing them what they're doing wrong. That's good. I was learning, Thank you. I learned a lot from you as well. And you're an incredible speaker, by the way. Yes, isn't he? Thank you. Absolutely incredible. Not a single arm um or R. I've been watching you very closely thinking, wow, this guy's a fucking professional. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Just wrapped up my YouTube ads presentation. Everyone in the room, loved it and uh, it was funny afterwards mike asked me he was like man that was the first time that i was able to see it live like see you like live and i was like how'd you like it and he was like dude it's great man it's phenomenal i was like yeah you know it's interesting i've done that presentation about like 15 times now at this point which isn't a lot but it's also not a little either it's not one or two and the reason i said that to him was because i realized even for me in that moment that it was easy for me to 
do everything I just did because I've been doing it for so long and it's just the reps, right? You put as many reps in as you can and you're obviously gonna get stronger, right? Just like I get stronger at public speaking and specifically with that topic because I've taught this, you know, done it for five and a half years now. So it's very easy for me to, to do. And uh, yeah, hopefully you got some value from that too. Uh, now we're gonna go in, get some food. It's late here, <laughs> running on a little bit of sleep as you guys already know, and uh, gonna fuel up and uh, head back in for part two to watch the man, the myth, the legend, Charlie, who gifted me with the new JT DuPont lighter, the admin lighter. A true admin needs a true admin lighter. And thank you, Charlie, for doing that. And uh, we'll definitely use it in the near future. But for now, let's get some food and uh, refuel. Sometimes the ultimate factor to how much your company sells for is not how good your company is, it's how good the market is. So a very specific example. So the company that we're um, they had already just raised 100 and, 110 million to go and buy companies, right? And at that point, it was like low interest rates. You know, cash was just going, 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 going. And so because of that, they were a lot more adventurous. They, they were a lot more lenient with just their deals. They were just like, okay, boom, 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 right? Like, fun story, I had another friend who had an agency business, yeah, who had a web agency business, which is doing four million, had no profit, like no profit at all. Uh, he sold that for 10 million, right? No profit, right? Because during that period, it was just like, Oh, there's a shit ton of money, private equity. Let's just keep going, going, going. Um, it's always best to sell to strategics who have private equity backing. So a very specific example, Brainland, the company that we're fan buys, they had raised money from a private equity company to buy companies. Now the great thing is like a private equity company, they fund you to go and buy companies. Like they can't just like sit on the cash. You know what I mean? So. A very interesting thing to do here, if you're ever thinking about um, uh, selling your company, is like in the last 12 or 18 months, which big people in your space have raised private equity? Because that's basically telling you that they have a mandate to go and buy companies. Um, because otherwise, if you wanted to sell to a big strategic person, um, they will need to buy you off their profits rather than from somebody else's money. And remember, if someone else gives you money and says spend it, you can spend it however you want. If it's your own profits, sometimes no, 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 I'm not sure. Sometimes what you want to do is the purchase of your business helps the buyer get a bigger valuation. So, for example, Ray Labs will buy Right now, bought fan buys because they didn't have an influencer marketing division. And they knew that by having an influencer marketing division, they could then get a higher valuation at the next round. Right? And so, if basically they're saying, if we bought you for 37 million and we know that we are adding like 50 million plus to our enterprise value, then I'm just going to do this deal every fucking day. Because I'm buying for 37 and I'm making 50. All right, cool. Like, it's a very easy equation. This is the reason why when you're looking at buyers, you want to be looking at buyers who have raised P or have like some kind of liquidity coming. It's like, oh, we need to go public. So for example, I imagine actually with the high risk deal, number one, I, I definitely don't think it was all cash. I think if anything it was all shares and it was all shares in the company because they wanted to go public and by them saying, hey, we have also a tracking system, blah, 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 they can get a higher valuation when they go public. So that therefore means actually for so many of the people here, a very interesting thing that you could do is almost like, um, if you wanted to sell your business at some point, identify a buyer who is going to have some kind of liquidity or wants to go public, wants to get a higher valuation, and then basically tell them the story of how you would help them get a higher valuation, right? Um, and if you just, like, that's the game. That's the game. Because remember, if anybody is dropping significant money, and I count significant money as anything over like 25 million, right? 
if anybody's gonna drop that on you, like they're not doing it because they like you. They're doing it because like you help them make more money. So you almost need to think for yourself, how do I help them make more money? You guys all know familiar, you're familiar with me? Do you know who I am somewhat? Of course. The legend. <laughs> not sure. the yeah. I'm a Sam, well, some others from Wish basically. Um, <laughs> I've got, I've got a couple of things. I haven't got anything planned. I've got no talk or no like thing. I've also got a tough act to follow from Timo as well. Um, I have got this PDF that I've been working on um, called Eight Figure Philosophy. Who wants to get to eight figures? Like, who wants to get to a mill a month? Like, who, who actually wants to do that? Like, hands up. Everybody want to do that? Because I can do it. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, because that's sort of where we are now. Just, we sort of hover, just, it pisses me off because we're just under eight figures, but we're nearly there, so I say we're eight figures. Um, so I can go through that thing, I can solve your problem as well for the what to work on, bottlenecks, how to define them, etc. Um, this is something from our program I've been working on for the last two weeks, so I actually want to kind of test it on you guys to see if it actually makes sense, so I hope that's okay. I've been spending the last month really on this document, figuring out like how we did it and what mental models and stuff you use. Seldom is it about ads or funnels or copy or sales scripts, it's all about mental models and how you see it and how you think. And this is the main thing I learned from Sam Evans, is like, it's about how you see it and show that. So, we're gonna go through this thing. So we'll start by defining it. So, scale of first principle in a business contract is basically just an increase in size. I think we can all agree on that. It's just taking something you've already got and just expanding it. And really, like, the online business thing, we can break into three buckets. So another first principle that we can define, that we absolutely know to be true, that we can reason from to get engaged in this thing, is we have three systems in our businesses and nothing else. You could argue you've got operational backend, but acquisition and conversion, which is getting more clients, increasing market share, more appointments, more leads, this is the stuff that you guys want. Right, this is what everyone thinks about this, but there's two more things that everyone forgets. Value delivery, which is more results, better results, more support, more questions from clients, more testimonials, better product. And then this is really the component of what you need to increase. And then the third thing is infrastructure. So this is what happens, what you need to build as a result of increasing the size of these two things. You need more systems, bigger team, more operations, more standard operating procedures, more communication. So in April last year, we had 14 people, and now we've got 30. So we've had to double the size of the team to double the size of the businesses. How do you actually know, like, okay, well, I've got client results, but how do you know you need a metric? There needs to be something definable that you can track, right, that actually makes sense. So first of all, you need to have a refund rate of less than 5 to 10%. So you know the first thing is results. The first thing you need as a condition is results. So how do you validate that? Because like, you know, someone could say, I get client results, like we've had one client. How do you know if things are gonna work at scale? So 90% of your clients are nightmare free. So this is a huge metric that we've been sort of tracking with Imperium and Easy Grow. It's like, if more than one out of 10 of your clients complain, moan, or drag their feet, that's just gonna, you're gonna if you scale volume, you're just gonna scale the problem. So that's the thing you have to bear in mind with scale. You're not just scaling the business, you're scaling the problems within the business. And so if you're struggling to deal with them on this small scale now, when you apply volume, that thing is going to be out, out of bloody hand. Dispute rate less than 2.5%. If that's not true, then Stripe will just destroy you. So that's a big one. Average collection on at least 50% of receivable cash on payment plans. So if you charge 10 grand, your lifetime value on any payment plan you collect on average needs to be at least 50%. And your average order value on day one cash collected is at minimum two to 25 to 50%. So what this means is if I charge uh, 9600, which I do for my program, I need to be collecting on average at least 2500 to $5,000 upfront in cash. If I don't do this and I try and scale ads, I get fucked. Because I'm, it's, I can't liquidate my ad spend, it's costing me too much money, I'm, at, I'm operating at a loss and I might not even collect any <coughs> money. Are you counting the 50% on cash uh, payment plans from the total uh, contract or from the 50% from besides the first uh, initial So these payment. are two separate me metrics. So this is lifetime value, this one here, yeah, and this is just day one. I know, so, but on the, on the, so the 50% you mean from total contracts, so you mean 50% collected of the 9,600? Yes. Okay. Yeah. How do you validate your offer? Well, if you've booked more than 120 appointments with it, it's valid. That's the number that I've come up with, I think if you've, and it, it comes into how we tie this into the appointments and how you validate your sales system as well. So, Basically what I'm saying is if you guys want to scale and grow, these are your priorities. This is what you focus on. And then once you've got all this in tow, you press a button. And then you just you increase your ad spend by like threefold and your business increases by threefold. It's not difficult to scale, it's hard to find these conditions. People think that scaling is this weird, like scary, abstract, weird thing that's like, oh, I don't know how to do it. But once you find these, you just press button. 
and then you sit back and you just make a ton of money. So, appointments, if you're running a cold system, like in a, a cold outbound appointment booking system, you need to have an appointment booking rate of at least 2.5% on the system. If you're running ads, you need to have a cost per strategy session of a $200 maximum, which is how much we pay per call. Hours is what, like $150 or something? Is it um, show up or book call? This is just book call. Okay. Book call. Because the show comes in in a second. Yeah. Oh, Validate the other one as well. This is every single metric. Uh, ads, 1.5x on day one cash collected, and 3x ROAS on lifetime collection. So our ad ROAS lifetime collection is, I believe, 3.7 at present, and day one is sort of around here. Um, so base, bear in mind, I'm basing these metrics off what I know works, because this is what I've done. So this isn't some like theory crafting, like, oh, it might be that. Like, I actually know this to be true, because this is what I've done for myself. So is your appointment booking rate 2.5%? Well, we don't do the, we just cut the call out on team, but it was 4% before. Yeah. So this is a pretty good way to make a bunch of cash. So you've sold, just a person, you've sold all like your expensive shit, like any watches or any crap like I never bought any. Right. I've got a Mercedes, obviously the palm is quite expensive, but I justify that because Bo and I both live there, which means that it's basically just one big meeting room, and then we both got our offices there and stuff, and it's quiet and peaceful. But that's expensive, but other than How that... How much is that? Huh? How much does that be uh, place? It's like 30 grand a month. So your goal then, to close the gap between where you are now and where you want to be, which is this billionaire, which is this goal of yours, mm -hmm. is to stack as much cash as possible and then wait for a crash and then invest that money in the crash in assets, maybe businesses or properties or whatever you do it, yeah. and then scale it that way. So look, put it this way. So I, I had this idea uh, a long time ago. Um, I came up with this idea that true pain manifests when the universe presents you with an opportunity that you did not have the character to prepare for. To prepare for. So my biggest fear is something coming along, like a fucking golden opportunity of a lifetime, and I haven't got the cash, energy, or time to put into it. So I can get the, I can, I can just get, I can shut down the business and get the energy and time like that. But I want as much cash as possible so that when something big comes along, that I could have an opportunity to start like a company or a platform. Or this is also why I'm building the audience as well. Because if you have cash and attention, you can basically become a billionaire of anything, pretty much in this day and age. So that's why. And this is how you make as much cash as bloody possible. And you know, the end game is the billionaire thing, and it's not because I want, you know, power and all this shit. It's just because I feel like that's how you complete the game. That's level 126 on RuneScape. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's like that's the top of the top. Once you've done that, it's like okay, I'll go and chill on the yacht now. No, so no way we work together at all. <laughs> so does. So does that all make sense? Does this clarify? Because like, this is literally, if you, if you just have this, then that's all you have, and that's, all, that's literally all you need to scale. Alexander the Great, he's conquered the known world, right? Um, not, the known, not the known world at this point, but he's conquered a lot of Macedonia, Persia, etc. He gets down to Egypt, and he, he, he's in Egypt, and he's chilling, and he's like dividing on the Nile or whatever, and he's welcomed into Egypt as God. The, the Pharaoh and the, the holy people that be at the time. And this is, bear in mind, this is Egypt in ancient civilization. So this is like the be all and end all of like, you know, truth. And they, and they bring him into the tombs and share, and they're like, you're God, they say to Alexander. And he, this is, this, I read this and it kind of resonated with me. He was just like, I'm not that I think I'm God, that's ridiculous. But he was like, he went in there and he was like, thank you for saying that, but I've got a bit more work to do. And then he just went and conquered Persia. And then like tried to go all the way to India and there's other mutiny and stuff. And so I read that. And then I started reading about Caesar and Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan's another <coughs> example where he built this the, the, the largest landmass empire in the world. Same thing with Caesar as well. He got to the proconsul, like the most powerful man in Rome. And then he went on to build an army and like conquer the rest of like tried to conquer England and shit. Anyway, all of that to say, I realized I ain't shit. I realized it was an ego thing. And I thought, like, I'm this, I've made it. And I realized that the reason that I thought that is because I was comparing myself to the average person. Where I was like, yes, I'm doing really well. Because I was making like, you know, 500 grand a month. I was like, you know, top of the info game, you know, top of the industry. And like, you know, I'm making loads of money and this, that, and the other. And then I started to think, and I started to read about these people that had done a million times better than me. Like, Alexander the Great Conqueror known the known world like 23. I've just made a couple of hundred grand. <laughs> like, you know, I ain't shit. So I realized that, and that recalibrated my perspective on, on life. And I, yeah, that was kind of where it came from. I was like, is this it? 
you know what I mean? Like, is this really what, is this really what, is this it? Like, I've, yeah, I'm in the info space, I've gone to Egypt, I'm not the best, I'm not the god, I'm not that, this, that, and the other, but it kind of feels like when you make that amount of money. So now it's like, yeah, I didn't do ayahuasca or anything really like that. I just started reading about people that are way better than me. And I still do that. And then same thing with Napoleon as well. I made himself emperor and was like, I'll take Russia. <laughs> you know? Got so right, you've read fucking emperor. You don't need to take Russia. He was like, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Then he failed. But. Dude, you said another thing with your, um, you leave all the money in the business. Mm -hmm. You have literally all the cash in one bank account. No. No, you spread it out across bank accounts. It's spread out across multiple bank accounts. Um, and then lots of different like investment. Um, like eToro and other brokers and stuff like that. Yeah, got it. Um, are you still investing in real estate or not? No, we sold that. We sold, sold it. We sold it all. You sold it all. Yeah. Why? All cash. You just want to hold cash. Want cash. Okay. Yeah. Because I know that in there will come a time. It might not be for the next couple of years, but there will come a time when I need cash, and that's all I need. And I don't know much of it as I can fucking get. You're gonna need it to afford a bunker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. He's. he's I am. Um, so, um, I have a slightly different take because I also went through this. Um, when we sold, I was saying to you, uh, I um, When we sold at 27, I had 15 million just in my Santander bank account. Right? Santander. Oh, sorry, what the fuck, right? Pop down the ice cream. Um, <laughs> um, and I grew up as a poor kid. I grew up like I grew up in Southeast London, poor kid. And I was like, "Fuck, this is more money than I even thought was." Like, what the fuck, basically, right? Especially being at 27, I was like, "Wow, okay, I'm done now." And I'll tell you a very interesting story that I went through a similar thing where I thought, "Okay, what now is?" Purpose. Like, what are we doing here? Um, and my first thought was go build another big company or go build a bigger company. Because what happens is anytime you have some kind of public exit, people then come in and other people who have you know, sold their companies were even more. I made very good friends with the founder of Lad Bible who had taken his company public for like 200 million. And so I'm like, Dude, you're 31, and I'm 27, and you took a company for like, and that got me very depressed. That actually had me thinking, ah, oh, the same feeling of, oh man, I ain't achieved nothing, right? And I realized then I started doing things just to prove to myself that like, I can do bigger things. So for example, my co-founder, instantly after we sold, went to start another business because he wanted to sell something for 100 million. And he called me every single month and said, this was a fucking stupid decision. Because investors funded him straight away. He raised like five million out the gate. Like boom, boom, right? Because you're like, you're already successful. And he said it was really, really bad decision. And I was very close to doing that because I was surrounded by other people who had sort of bigger, bigger, bigger companies. So, where I slightly deviate um, from Charlie is, I actually don't have that framing of, I haven't done anything yet. What I told myself was, I literally got a sheet of paper out and I wrote my Wikipedia entry. Like, I said I was writing it in third person. And I was like, look at how far you fucking come in, right? Like, and then everything I started doing was not based out of a, I need to prove. It was like, yo, look how far you've come. Everything else is complete upside. Have fun. Which moved, in fact, I actually think, this is my wallpaper. My wallpaper literally says, I've already won, all of this is upside, act like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just that framing made everything like positive. I would start businesses with people, I'd invest in stuff and I'd be like, yo, this is gonna be fun. I'm not out here trying to like, let's get to the next level. For what? So I changed that whole frame. And it's slightly different because I think at the beginning, I was coming from like a negative place. I was coming from like, I need to do better. I need to do shit. And then I was like, I've already done shit. 
So everything here, like literally everything, the person I marry, the car I buy, the new business I start, um, if I start a new business, it's all like just fun and from a positive frame. And I do think that is a much better frame because, dude, I've been in a room with someone who saw his company, 300 million, a billion, two billion, like the founder of Monzo. It's like this shit would always keep going. Yeah. It would always keep fucking going, right? So you have to not like measure yourself by the gap. You have to measure yourself by the game. And the game is where you were to where you are now, rather than a kind of like, there's always a gap. Because I, I, I sat in a fucking room with five people, Hussein, some guy who sold a company, 656 million. Aria, Lab Bible, 200 million. Um, Alex, 300 million. And they were all like, oh man, now I've got to get the billion. And then a fourth guy came in, <laughs> who was uh, from the Kamani family. The Kamani family are the guys who own Boohoo, pre like PLT, who sold for a billion. And they were all like, oh man, there's other guy. I said, what the fuck is going on, boy? What the fuck is going on? Be fucking happy, right? So anyway, that's my addition to this. Because I generally went through that and I was like, fuck, this world is so fucking shit. And I'm just like, I ain't shit. And then I changed it. And I would encourage everyone, because look, everyone here is gonna win, right? By virtue of you, paying this man as well. Um, by virtue of you being here, by virtue of that, like, you're all going to win at something. Maybe it's not this business, maybe it's not the next business, maybe it is this business, but you're going to win. And you're gonna get that same sense of like, oh man, like, is this it? Lean into that, because you're all fucking ambitious people. So you'd be like, is this it? And then you change it to like, this isn't. And now everything else is going to be outside. Way better framing, way better stress levels. You just look better, you also act better, and you stop being a pussy up, right? Anyway, that's fine. Day three has officially wrapped up. I'm here with the final takeaway from one of the members of the Boardroom Mastermind, Dubai Boardroom, Riza Kubani, tech founder and entrepreneur an investor. Bro, what was your biggest takeaway from this weekend? There was a lot. Oh, well, so... I mean, yeah. you and I were just talking about the power of Bitcoin, but we'll, we might say that for another tangent. <laughs> sure thing, man. So, firstly, Brian, um, this event was amazing. My first ever mastermind. And Sick. what was really good about it for me is I, I've been in business for nine years yeah. since the age of uh, 15. Yeah. And like yourself, we're not very normal, right? We're doing stuff on a very high, high level. And um, this event was the first time for me I could network with people who were like me. Yeah where it felt like, ah, I'm in my, uh, my tribe. So that was amazing. And, um, and uh, the talks about, you know, accepting where, accepting where you're at, uh, being thankful for it was all very good. But um, your talk as well, man, on YouTube Bounds was crazy. That, and uh, yeah, yeah, Brian, you're the king. Moncada. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's been coming up to me all weekend. Moncada, I'm like, bro, Moncada. that's so funny because everybody in high school would say that. Yeah. My, my college football coaches always just say my last name. So when he says it, it just gives me good vibes. And you gave me some good advice this weekend, bro. And I would recommend everybody follow him because his journey and where he's going and what we've talked about, you're gonna wanna pay attention to that. Especially with the technology, considering what he's doing, you're gonna wanna pay attention to that because he's sold me on a few things that we won't discuss right here. But man, I, I, I'm thankful for you and what you've told me, not just with my business and the insights that you've learned from your business, how you've helped me, which again, we can discuss at later times, but. Bro, I'm thankful for you, man. So if you're watching this, you got to follow Riza Kubani, bro, 100%. Well, guys, I want to say that I'm thankful, Brian, for you, for your amazing talks. And, you know, Brian, what's really special about you is you've worked with some greats in the world, and you're the most down-to-earth guy, oh, humble man. guy, great advice. You always uh, listen, and you know more about shit than most people do. And uh, I think you're, you're going to do very well, and um, I'm excited, bro, for your future, for your kids one day, your, your family. So... Uh, Everyone, I think you're all. I think you're all, all already following Brian. But but if you're not, do it. Do it as well. Thank you, bro. Appreciate you. Thank you, bro. Hell yeah. So I was sick. Buy Bitcoin. <laughs> Buy Bitcoin. Seriously, that that was the thing. All right. So we're gonna flip the camera around and get Mike's top takeaway from the weekend, filming everything behind the scenes to see what he's learned throughout this weekend too. Mike, what was your top takeaway, bro? Yo, what up? Um, yeah, it's it's been a great three days. Uh, day one, day two, day three was the best like experience and being first time in the mastermind with my uh, boss Brian Moncada, it's our first time to meet, and it was really a great experience like listening. Though I'm just docu documenting the whole event, but I'm really into 
into the the pe the speakers, the members. Like this are like really expensive, <laughs> really expensive <laughs> group of people here, like millionaires. And just I'm just like there's a lot of takeaways there, but the the best takeaways that I can give is like the ready, ready fire aim, especially what the what um, Charlie Morgan um, said it um, a while ago. It was like uh, just do the things you like off the cuff because it will like if you if you like prepare for something to be perfect you won't do it because you're you're very anxious like how would it look how does the quality of my video how's my lighting if there's someone gonna knock on the door <laughs> uh, charlie morgan, uh, morgan uh, mentioned that earlier and it was like damn he was a point because we're in the in a phase right now with brian like we're struggling on our content mm -hmm. like we have we have this plan plan out but um, we're still not that in in that uh, in the right direction. Like we're figuring out something. If you do everything that you enjoy, it will definitely give you the output that you uh, you need. No expectations. Like less ex less expectations will uh, give you a more like a satisfactory results because you didn't expect anything from from the content. Like what also um, Dr. Mike said. Like um, just. Uh, Upload your videos, upload your contents, and don't expect something. Mm. Yeah, just upload those, like being be very consistent with your channel, your contents like that. So it's really nice because that's what, what our purpose right now, yeah. like with Brian, like yeah. to, to be here, to hear from these um, YouTubers that have like millions of subscribers. And we're just like 12,000 subscribers. And we're, we're doing it for more for uh, years now. Yeah. And they're doing it for a lot, like, six years ten years they're doing it and yeah i was really i was really like into into the moment like sometimes i, for, I forget to record <laughs> because oh shit <laughs> that was a good content <laughs> luckily i have the, the videographer of this event is a filipino so <laughs> I, I i i get some of the clips there but yeah really i sometimes i really forget because it the the, the rooms like full of ideas yeah. like if if you're gonna experience this mastermind like one of this this your, your life's gonna change for sure like your mindset's gonna change i'm really excited to go home to start working to start planning with brian on our contents because this mastermind is really dope man so if you're if you if you're still right there um doubting to join mastermind like this invest in yourselves this one's really good mastermind is like uh Will, will really change your mind. The Dubai Boardroom Mastermind Day 3 has officially come to an end. I'm here with the man himself, Will Brown. Will, dude, I've interviewed everybody pretty much for the most part of the Mastermind, gotten their top takeaways. Each and every one of them shared something great, shared how amazing of an experience this was. Me and Mike even included, obviously, so thank you for you know even inviting us to be here. But dude, I wanna know from you, man, how was it for you to host this event and what was your biggest takeaway from the weekend? Well, it feels just incredible to be able to bring people of this caliber together. And I'm very lucky that people even attend the, the bloody thing. I mean, I feel very lucky to be able to fly out people like Brian, uh, people like David Dre, to have people like Charlie Morgan come along as well and, and countless other people. And it just feels like a blessing to be able to even host the thing. And it's just incredible to be able to uh, learn from everybody, share what I'm learning. It's just amazing. I, I feel I feel very very, very lucky and very pumped to uh, to have the events. So. You can tell Will's having the time of his life when he's doing this. <laughs> by the way, like it was funny because when I talk to Will, I always get energized and excited because he is truly living his best life and having fun doing exactly what he's always wanted to do, and that's something that's inspiring to see. So I just wanted to make sure that. They saw that too, man. And, and I yeah. trust me when, when this video drops, dude, they're gonna experience it and get the behind the scenes sneak peek of what they could experience too. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Thank you for having us, bro. Pleasure.